Welcome to the Jewish Drinking Show, the number one podcast for drinking in Jewish wisdom, history, tradition, and more. Hi. Welcome to the 103rd episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome first-time guest of the show, Marla Kaufman. Thanks for having me, Drew. My absolute pleasure. So for those less familiar with Marla Kaufman, she is the executive director and founder of the Jewish Addiction Awareness Network. Jan, after her own family's decade plus experience of navigating resources to support their son's journey from addiction to recovery, Marla has dedicated her life's work to silencing, silencing stigma and raising awareness. Since beginning Jan in 2016, Marla has traveled to Jewish communities across the United States to share innovative programs, proven strategies, and best practices to help communities collaboratively address addiction and related mental health challenges from a Jewish perspective. She provides support to Jewish families in crisis and those desiring to integrate their recovery with their Judaism and leads Jewish cultural sensitivity trainings for medical and addiction treatment professionals. So welcome, Marla. Thanks so much. Really glad to be here. Absolutely. And so as, as yeah, so, and as listeners uh, and, and viewers might be able to, you know, what's the connection? Well, one of one piece of addiction is alcohol addiction. So, and thus, thus you are here with us. So Jan, the Jewish Addiction, so Marla, what is the Jewish Addiction Awareness Network? And I know I covered a little bit of that in your uh, brief bio. Right. Um, so broadly speaking, uh, Jan, what, is, uh, w- what does it do and, and what does it provide? Sure. We have uh, three main things that we do. Uh, one is that we uh, develop educational programs mm-hmm. for communities and Jewish clergy and Jewish communal professionals, uh, addiction awareness uh, type programs. And we collaborate with uh, lots of different Jewish organizations across the country on those programs. And then we host a really big resource website. Mm -hmm. uh, And that's a huge component of our organization. The website has an entire resource section. There are Jewish resources that are geographically broken up. There are general resources. There's a library section. There's are, there are really interesting blogs from guest authors uh, from a Jewish perspective on addiction and recovery issues. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep, there's the website. There's the website, yep. The other thing we do is that we really support individuals and families who are struggling, mm-hmm. who reach out and call and they, ha- they really need a listening ear. Um, we don't do clinical work, so we stay in our lane. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is really peer support and uh, directing people people towards resources specifically that we think will help them. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. And I'm curious. Obviously, this is the Jewish Drinking Show. How much? Uh, how would? How? I don't know if numbers or percentages, but how frequently do you find that drinking addiction or alcohol addiction is is a uh, is how prevalent is it? Well, it's almost always a part. Oh, it. really? So uh, it it can be somebody that just has alcohol use disorder Mm -hmm. or a family member that they're dealing with. But I would say that, I don't know, I I don't know what percentage, but I think almost always if somebody is involved in illicit drug use, that alcohol is one of the substances that's Mm -hmm. in there. And I I don't really differentiate between alcohol and drugs. They're They're both mind altering substances that when you know, used in, used in certain ways can ruin lives. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's pretty prevalent. So it's, it's, it's directly relevant to, to, uh, to this topic. Absolutely. And I know we briefly uh, mentioned in your bio that your, your own personal experience was, was a catalyst in your founding of JAAN. So I'm, I'm curious to hear a little bit more. So how did you decide to start JAAN? Sure. Well, I always say that nobody wakes up in the morning and decides to do this kind of work. (laughs) I've never met someone yet. You know, there's always a personal connection. And that's, of course, the case uh, in my case as well. Hmm. In 2006, our son came off of a team trip to Israel that uh, he went with our Bureau of Jewish Education to. Hmm. uh, And uh, we just knew that something wasn't right when he walked off the plane. It did not start in Israel. Um, I mean, it started before, but uh, I, you know, people and uh, kids and also keep it together until they can't keep it together. And we didn't know what was wrong, but we thought something was wrong. We didn't have a whole lot of warning signs. He was still getting very good grades in school. He was still emptying the dishwasher. He was still, 
you know, a great family member. I'm very close to his younger brother, which I'm happy to say they're still very, very close to this mm-hmm. day. Um, but we knew something was wrong and we brought him to an adolescent psychologist. And in the third session, the psychologist came out and said, uh, I want you and your, you know, I want you, my husband was with me. I want you to come in uh, and, uh, and your son has something to say to you. And I, I, I don't want you to, to really react, just listen. Uh, which was one of the hardest things that we had to do. And out came what he had been doing, like in in detail. And Mm -hmm. it shocked us, absolutely shocked us. Um, And I know from that experience that our son wanted help, which is often the case from the Mm get-go. Otherwise, he would not admit to in full what he had been doing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess to, to frame where we, as far as the Jewish community, my husband and I and our family were very involved in the Jewish community, and mm-hmm. we were leaders in the Jewish community. I was mm-hmm. on a rabbi search committee. I served <laughs> on the board for social action. Wow. You know, we went to synagogue services regularly. Our kids went to elementary school, day school. My husband did financial aid review. Huh. And I'm not like saying this just to like list all of our, you know, contributions to our community, yeah. but, you know, kids were bar mitzvah, camp all, you know, went to Jewish camp just to say that we were very, very entrenched in our Jewish community. Um, Mm. And then when this came into our lives, the hardest thing that ever, ever came into our lives, uh, there was a real, well, at best, I would say a lack of response and resources for us from our Jewish community. Mm. And at worst, we experienced quite a bit of judgment and stigma. Uh, And uh, it was very unpleasant and very surprising. And this is the mid 2000s, right? 2006. Yeah. 2000, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that you brought up what year it was because it wasn't on the front page, this issue of every newspaper. Um, and so we felt really like odd ones out. Hmm. And of course, we were shocked. Like, how could this happen, you know, to our nice Jewish family? We were naive. Hmm. Uh, we had no idea that the kind of substances that our, that our son was involved with even existed in our, you know, you know, affluent area high school. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think now these days, those people Mm -hmm. aren't as naive about those things. It's it's unfortunately, we have a lot of company now Mm -hmm. more more than we have when we began. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you think part of that is just people have a greater awareness of it? They're less willing to necessarily sweep it under the rug? Well, I think in general, um, we're going to get, I'm going to, I plan to share some statistics with you later. So it's really hard to sweep those kind of numbers under the rug. But for, for the Jewish community, there's a myth that needs to be dispelled, which is that this particular, you know, malady, this particular illness doesn't affect us in the numbers that it does other groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's just not the case. Uh, And it keeps people in, in shame and stigma and silence. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it was fear, fear and ignorance. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's a scary thing to have a a child who descends into addiction, the behaviors and everything that goes along with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that people in our community were like, uh, you know, wanting to point fingers at our family unfairly Mm -hmm. um, based on nothing. I mean, there are no perfect families, but we were very, very functional, loving you know, present family, um, you know, to say, oh, there must be something that they did terribly wrong, you know, that we're not going to do. So this isn't going to happen to us. Hmm. Uh, And then they just don't know how to respond. And that's, that's really part of Jan's, you know, big part of Matt Jan's mission is not only helping people who are already in this space, individuals and families who are affected by substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder, Mm -hmm. but teaching communities members to be empathetic and to know how to handle, uh, uh, you know, supporting families like ours. You know, I, I can give you one really, really mm-hmm. chilling example mm-hmm. of the stigma that we felt. Um, we ended up sending our son away uh, out of state for treatment. He was a minor and we were able to do that. And I firmly believe that we saved his life by doing that. Mm-hmm. Of course, that got around the community like wildfire, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, a little while after we uh, sent him for treatment, uh, my best friend and I showed up to the Israel Fair in our community. And the person mm-hmm. that was registering people was, I would say that she 
was not a close friend, but she was way more than an acquaintance. Our kids were in the same bar mitzvah class. They went to Jewish camp together. We were at our, we have eaten at a, we had eaten at our, each other's Shabbat tables. Hmm. Um, so just as the context, she could not pick up her head to look at me. Wow. And, and it was really obvious why, and it was really pronounced. Hmm. And I left with my friend and I came home and sobbed. So oh, wow. that, that's part of, you know, that's just one example. So I imagine that hopefully, now I don't know, but hopefully these things have, I don't know, become better or, or communities have hopefully been able to deal with this a little bit better in the last decade and a half. Now, I don't know, but I imagine, I imagine it's still a widespread issue, right? Of, of communities not knowing how to deal or otherwise handle such situations. Yeah. Yes, it is still widespread. I would say that, there, that progress has been made. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like to think that Jan has been a part of that progress, mm -hmm. um, you know, and other organizations that are in the space. Um, but there's still a lot of work to be done and it's very sporadic. So some communities, you know, seem to, you know, really be addressing it. Other communities know they should be and want help to address it. And then there are communities that just don't want to deal with it, just want to stick their head in, head in the sand. Um, because it's easier. Thought, it's yeah. easier just stick one's head in the sand, yeah. right? Yeah, especially mm -hmm. if it's a difficult issue uh, that's complex. Mm -hmm. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics as well as uh, potential guests, including, who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you. And now back into the show. I would say that there's, I still talk to families who feel disenfranchised from their communities over this issue. Also, we'll tell you that we became unaffiliated over this for four years. That's how pronounced it was back then in the mid 2000s. Um, and we've since, uh, you know, reaffiliated in a very big way and, and feel met very much a part of our community. Oh, good. Is to what do you, to what do you attribute? Um, I, I want to say like, what makes it difficult for community? Is it that they're not equipped to know how to think or talk about these sort of situations and these challenges, or is it something else? Like, what do you, what would you attribute it to? I think a lot of communities uh, and, and clergy and leaders are, you know, I, I don't think that they spend, if they spend any time, it's not even more than a nanosecond in rabbinical, cantorial, you know, clergy schools. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the Jewish family services uh, don't have specialized clinicians that have addiction training. Some do, mm -hmm. some definitely do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, a dearth of uh, 12 step recovery meetings, meeting in Jewish spaces. Again, there, I can think of a couple of communities that really have quite a few, mm -hmm. um, but hardly any. I mean, mm -hmm. in the community that I raised, that we raised our children in, um, mm -hmm. uh, there, were, there was absolutely no 12 step meetings or any other kind of recovery meetings in a Jewish space at all. And we have since wow. moved to another community and well, I, I say, wow, I'm not going to mention where it is, but I know that there's a lot of Jewish infrastructure where you had been a decade and a half ago. So, yeah, I will tell you that that community and we can get into that, you know, as well, uh, you know, absolutely turned around. And, and mm. just, just to um, just to let you know, you want to know about the origins, you know, why I started Jan. So yeah. about eight, eight years into our journey with our son, I read a book called Recovery, the 12 Best Steps in Jewish Spirituality by Rabbi Paul Steinberg, hmm. who uh, is someone who's in recovery from alcohol use disorder. And I think he would say workaholism as well. Hmm. And uh, when I saw the title of this book, I immediately got a warm feeling like, oh, my goodness, this is this is like marrying my two worlds. <laughs> and I ordered the book and I read it in an afternoon. Paul had personal reflections in there about his own journey, as well as he related a lot of um, recovery philosophy to to Jewish texts and, and, and Jewish concepts, uh, which was wonderful. But it was one of his personal reflections. And I can just uh, share with you these these mm -hmm. couple of quotes 
sure. uh, that really turned my life around. And it's that's why we're sitting here today speaking. Mm -hmm. So the first one was, he said, in my experience, I found a lot of ignorance and denial in the Jewish community about alcoholism and addiction. There are very few Jewish institutions that serve addicts. Rarely do rabbis speak from the pulpit about the disease of addiction even though we know that there are a lot of families touched by and struggling with alcoholism and addiction. So right there, he named what I had been experiencing for eight years. So he gave validation to that. And then he said, my Judaism is not separate from my addiction recovery, but integrated into it. And I was in the program that's, you know, the 12 step program uh, that supports family members. And I was looking for that integration. Um, but the, the one line that he said that just really changed the direction of my life is, he said, what I know for myself now is that I will not contribute to Jewish ignorance about my disease. Mm. And I turned the book over and I said, okay, there was a definite before and after reading that sentence. And I, mm. I called Paul the next day and I said, I read your book in one day. It's changed my life. I need to meet you. We have to have lunch. <laughs> And we did, and we work very, very closely. He's on our advisory board, and um, mm -hmm. uh, he's involved in some of the workshops that we, we put on as well. Mm -hmm. So if you think that one book or one sentence can't, you know, change a life, there you go. That's wonderful. I hope you've been enjoying this episode so far with Marla Kaufman. I want to break in and give you a sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Yami and Dr. Alone Cole. Mizigat HaKos mixing wine which is a whole other like that's a cultural reference that we can't even relate to like what does that even mean mixing wine washing his face hands and feet making his bed yeah i miss the good old days i hope you enjoy that sneak peek and it's next week's episode which i hope you stay tuned for and now back into this episode featuring marla kaufman for you i mean you had already started jan when you came across this book right oh oh the book was the, book was the inspiration and motivation really Oh, uh, okay. So what, what happened was after I, I met with Paul, I decided, you know, how you have to start at home, right? Charity mm -hmm. begins at home or oh. all those things. And uh, so I, I got brave enough to, I was still living in that community, to go to the community and say, we've got to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to the board of rabbis. Some of them were familiar with our family story and some were not. Uh, and a lot of them I could see when I spoke felt bad, bad about our experience. And by this time, it was eight years later, it was like 2014, 2015. So more, I think, congregants had come to them, you know, seeking counsel on this. Now, a lot of times Jewish families, even today, do not want to go to their clergy about this because they don't want to look bad in front of their clergy. And so there's there's the stigma as well. Um, but. I told them that I was going to, going to come back to them and that I was going to require things of them. And so I did, and I, I basically asked them to appoint a task force member from every organization and synagogue in the county. Mm. And we met quarterly. And those representatives were kind of the liaison to their synagogue organization. And what we did was to do things collaboratively. So what, what we started with, which is still our signature program today, is our clergy and Jewish professionals educational workshop, which we mm. brought to over a dozen communities across the country and mm. have some scheduled for this year for 2022. Wow. Um, because you need to get everybody in. It's really great if you get everybody in a community in a room across the Jewish spectrum, meaning across mm. denominations, across synagogues, across organizations, and as best as possible, get them to put aside any territorial feelings <laughs> um, and come together on this. And that's exactly what our community did. And we went from having nothing to having 12-step meetings in some, some synagogues, to having wow. the Serenity Shabbat services that were like a, addiction awareness and celebration of recoveries during service, you know, recovery during services. Hmm. Um, it went from having to pull teeth to get congregations to be on the schedule to people calling and saying, well, we want to be on, we don't want to wait that long. Can we get on the schedule? So mm -hmm. it really completely uh, uh, turned around mm -hmm. and what, and became a model for these other communities. Hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. That's really great. Do you, the, the clergy thing that's only uh, community based, right? 
when you offer the clergy uh, workshops? We do it geographically for the reason that we want people. So we don't just do a seminar. Um, of course, we did this in person pre-COVID and it was mm -hmm. almost a full day, but mm -hmm. we have reduced it on Zoom to between two and three hours, depending. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we like to do it by community and not just open it up as a training for any clergy from anywhere on Zoom, mm -hmm. because it's so important to get the community you know, bonding over the issue. And, and our last part of our workshop is, you know, what is this community's next step? And mm -hmm. then we turn, turn it back over to someone in the community to shepherd that discussion. But there's always a commitment to do something. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's something really big. And sometimes it's just one small step and then we'll reconvene and, and you know, go from there. Mm -hmm. What communities miss make a mistake about is that there needs to be some big research study or a whole bunch of you know, grants and funding before they can, you know, oh. attack this issue. Uh, and that's just not, the, that's nice. And sometimes it comes after, but, you know, you need to begin to begin. Yeah. I guess for me, I was asking, granted, you know, full disclosure, I'm a rabbi. I was thinking about my rabbinic colleagues, if they wanted to to gain access and, and you know, to, to learn about it. And I'm, I guess really maybe in more nutshell version, what have you found has been particularly I guess lacking for rabbis what and what rabbis have found particularly valuable um, in what you've uh, been able to, to teach or, or what's an important message for rabbis or other Jewish clergy? Well, our workshops start out with a clinician basically mm -hmm. talking from a clinical viewpoint of what is alcohol use disorder and what is substance use disorder so that they get a medical background so that we all know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for clergy to, to know, to disavow themselves if they hold this mistaken belief that, that it doesn't happen in our Jewish communities. Um, you know, it's interesting because I've come across stuff from the 19th century and even the mid 20th century that it was this common the sense, of, not just amongst Jews, even amongst Gentiles, that Jews really didn't have this issue, even though it's, I mean. Well, it's, it's, it's in our Torah. The issue's <laughs> in our Torah. I mean, how many, how many of the people in our Torah, you know, get into trouble when they uh, drink a little, you know, too much alcohol, right? <laughs> right. Um, so I, I, I'm just way back. Right. I was just um, saying that there's this common myth out there, even though it really has no, I think the People, I think people have this basis because of, you know, just sort of perception, but even though not real knowledge. I, I think that when, because we're, we're in the United States, you know, uh, the Jews are, you know, immigrant, you know, we're immigrants and first generation immigrants, not too many, right, you know, decades ago, um, that we didn't want to hang our dirty laundry out as well. So, we, mm. you know, wanted to, to look good and fit in and become Americans. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, I, I also think that we have caught up now. We are so entrenched as American Jews hmm. that we, we suffer from every ill that America you know, has to offer, including hmm. this, which has hmm. risen in the, in the Jewish and in the general population. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Speaking of which, is this a, a segue into statistics? Sure. Okay. <laughs> it's a very smooth opportunity for us to, yeah. to move that direction. I'm going to give some general statistics. Yeah. Uh, you know, the um, SAMHSA reports that there are 40 million Americans suffering with an active substance use disorder, which includes alcohol use disorder, mm -hmm. that are 12 and older in America. Now, what's interesting about that statistic is that in 2019, it was 20 million. So you're going to say, well, wow, the pandemic really had an effect, you know, that it, it doubled how many people have an active substance use disorder. So I mm -hmm. want to explain that in case anybody knew that statistic before and is confused and like, why did it double? It's because the um, DSM manual, which has all of the mental health issues in it um, and the criteria for it, there a, a new DSM manual came out. It went from DSM-4 to DSM-5 and the criteria was changed and I, I want to go and read exactly what the criteria is now. I haven't had a chance to do that, but because of that, it caught in its net uh, way, way more people. So it's 40 million. And out of those 40 million, only 6.5% get treatment. Hmm. Now imagine if 
only 6.5 percent of cancer treat cancer patients got treatment. What an mm. uproar there would be, right? Mm. Um, also, there are a hundred. There have been a hundred thousand overdose deaths reported by the CDC for the twelve month period ending April twenty twenty one, and that's a twenty eight percent increase over last year. It's the highest wow. in any twelve month period ever. Um, it's wow. always been higher than car crashes, uh, uh, certain kinds of, you know, breast and prostate cancer combined, mm-hmm. uh, more than what we, you know, soldiers that we lost in the Vietnam War, just to put it in, in perspective, but it's never been this high. And that is the pandemic's yeah. influence. Mm. Uh, and also the fact that fentanyl is now, you know, prevalent and fentanyl is a opioid that is, I don't know, a hundred times more powerful than heroin. Mm. And uh, it's a uh, chemical substance that usually comes to America from Mexico, uh, made with raw materials, raw chemicals that are uh, from China. And it's all over and the, and it's, it's put into all kinds of, laced into all kinds of drugs that unknowingly people who go to use certain kinds of drugs uh, um, that are might be might be opioids, might not be opioids. Could be cocaine. Could be any anything. Um, you know, it's it's in there, and they don't know it, and they don't have a tolerance for it, and they end up ODing because of it. Very mm. dangerous. Oh wow! So th- those two things are why it's up so high. Mm. But I do want to give you another statistic, which is that there are over twenty three million people in long term recovery in our country, and that's the hopeful statistic. Okay. And lest you, lest anyone thinks that this is not a Jewish issue, in 2013, I know it was a while ago, but I'm sure it hasn't changed. The United Nations put out a study of the um, five top countries for illicit drug use, and number one was the United States, no surprise there, and number mm-hmm. five was Israel. Oh wow! So where do the majority of Jews live in the United States in Israel? Mm-hmm. Wow. One of the terms you've been mentioning is as far as, you know, previously on, on the website, I had something about alcohol abuse and, and stuff like that. And you suggested different wording. And also um, that page now has, you know, it, and there's also a concern. I know you would um, about certain treatment uh, centers. So do you mind touching upon that for a moment, just about, both about the language and also about the concern about treatment centers? Sure, yeah. sure. So first of all, uh, Rabbi Drew, I want to thank you for being open to that feedback and for mm-hmm. changing things on that page. I was thank really um, grateful for that. My pleasure. Uh, thank you so for suggesting have, it. <laughs> we have to be careful about the language we use. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a, a, what's called an addictionary on uh, the Recovery Research Institute website that's very good. And we have a link to it, I believe, on our website. Mm-hmm. Um, but words like uh, drunk, uh, junkie, mm-hmm. uh, clean, uh, uh, you know, off, off the wagon, uh, trying, to, trying to think of, of, of other ones, they're not helpful. And even mm-hmm. substance abuse or alcohol abuse, uh, they have found that the word abuse has a negative connotation where people... Mm-hmm you know, perpetuate stigma um, in the general community and even in the medical community. Mm -hmm. So really the language, you know, we want to do a person first language like we do for lots of other things. So, you know, even saying that somebody is an alcoholic or an addict is labeling them. You wouldn't say somebody who had cancer is a cancer. Uh, So it's it's somebody who who suffers with alcohol use disorder or somebody who has Mm. substance use disorder. Although I will say that when it is the person themselves that are struggling or in recovery, mm-hmm. I, in my opinion, they have full reign to call themselves whatever they want and often do say, I'm mm-hmm. an alcoholic, mm-hmm. I'm an addict. So there is, there is language that, that needs to be uh, cleaned up, like in any, any space, mm-hmm. we learn and we evolve. So you prefer alcohol misuse disorder? Alcohol use disorder uh-huh. or substance use disorder mm-hmm. or addiction. Uh, sometimes alcohol misuse, mm. substance use misuse. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. And Thank you. And the treatment centers. Yeah. I'd also had links that I 
that came yeah. my way. And so yeah. I, I, I shared them. Hopefully, you know, I, I thought, okay, you know, if people want to go find treatment, but I guess they're not all created equally, apparently. Uh, there's a lot of unethical treatment out there. Mm. It's really a landmine. And yeah. so it's interesting because you told me, and this happens to me all the time at Jan, is that these treatment centers, you know, found you, contacted you and say, hey, mm -hmm. here's an article about, you know, alcohol use disorder that I think, you know, your listeners are, you know, might be interested in. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, and not knowing, you know, <laughs> not doing anything, you, know, you just didn't know. Oh, yeah. okay, that sounds good, you know, and, and, and put it up. But really... <laughs> They're constantly asking to be linked on Jan and to have articles and this and that. And mm -hmm. sometimes that, you know, they, they pretend to be educational articles and maybe they do have good information, but it yeah. leads to a for-profit treatment center that we can't possibly do due diligence on all of them. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be like that. You're recommending one over the other because we're not clinicians and we, and we haven't, you can't do our due diligence on every treatment center. A lot of them link to what I call body brokers, which is the worst of the worst. What um, do they do? Body brokers are, you know, a lot of times you'll see an 800 number or a website or a commercial a radio on, on television. You know, if you need help, call in, you know, we've got counselors standing by. And I mean, there are some where you call in and they are on their computer while they're talking to you or, you know, the person or their family member, and they are selling you to the highest bidder to get a mm. kickback to, you know, a bunch of networks of treatment centers that they, uh, that, you know, there's a lot of insurance fraud. Mm. And I, I, I have to say there is good ethical treatment and things are getting better. So I don't want to, I don't want to discourage anyone from seeking treatment for themselves or a loved one. Definitely not. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying we have to be careful Yeah. and it's, it's best to have nonprofit or, or government, you know, websites with information. There's plenty of that out there. That's more neutral and more vetted. So oh, good. Hey there. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I want to break in again. And if you have ideas beyond the show, beyond the podcast, beyond this video content, if you have ideas for what Jewish drinking can bring you, whether it's, who knows, maybe it's Zoom sessions, maybe it's uh, events, maybe, who knows, swag, please let me know. I'm very curious to hear from you any ideas, things that we can do, uh, things that I can bring you from Jewish drinking. So feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. I'm happy to bring that to you. All right, now back into the show. Here at the Jewish Drinking Show, we're keenly aware of the role of alcohol in Jewish life. How do you, Marla, help people who struggle with alcohol in Jewish life navigate it? Well, I would say the first thing is, uh, if they're not aware, to make them aware. And this is something that we teach clergy as well. Clergy should know this which is, uh, you know, there is no commandment, there is no obligation to consume alcohol in order to fulfill a mitzvah. Absolutely not. And some people, you know, point to, well, you have to have a certain amount of, you know, wine at the Seder, you have to, you know, Purim, you know, can't tell the difference between Haman and Mordechai. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's absolutely not true. And there's a lot of texts and some of them have been um, featured on some of your other podcasts that actually do warn about, about that. There's, you know, in Talmud and Midrash. Um, but what is the biggest, the highest mitzvah in Judaism? It's Pekuach Nefesh. It, 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 you know, it's above everything else, the saving of a life. So if your life is going to be endangered by, you know, trying to fulfill some mitzvah, uh, you know, a, another mitzvah, then, then that mitzvah is not for you. The mitzvah is actually not to imbibe. So uh, I don't want anyone to feel like, you know, they're not being a full Jew if they don't drink alcohol. Mm -hmm. I would say the other thing that I would tell someone to do is if they're comfortable is advocating for themselves in Jewish spaces. In other words, making sure that the, the places that they're involved with have alternative beverages that aren't just water, but something a little bit more tasty and fun, along with the alcohol that's offered. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a big problem in our uh, Jewish communities and synagogues, et cetera, of a lot of alcohol drinking that is not for ritual, which I'm not like saying, if you don't have a problem with alcohol, you should never, you know, drink socially. No, I'm not saying that, but there has been 
an increase of activities that have alcohol even in the name of the event, like latkes and vodkas. And, and it seems that some places, synagogues and organizations, it's, a, it's all the time. Mm. It's everywhere. It's not, it's ritual and it's every social event. And I had a reform rabbi tell me once that at his board meetings, they drank uh, uh, oh, wow. and actually showed me, we were planning a serenity Shabbat service together and opened up a cabinet in his office and it was full of really expensive booze. Wow. And he said, I just want, I want you to see Marla that my congregants think these are, this is the gift that I want. That's how much entrenched the drinking is in our, in our congregation. Hmm. And then the third thing is that I, um, would illuminate how many texts we have and how much our narrative as a people can help people in recovery. There's so much connection. I mean, the, the biggest ones that come to mind is, is our national narrative of Exodus. Hmm. I mean, we went from slavery to freedom. Well, what is going from being enslaved, you know, by addiction to the wonderful life of recovery? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it parallels very well. What about the golden calf? You know, uh, you know, taking substances, uh, you know, looking for, for ways to soothe our anxieties. You know, when Moses didn't come down in time, uh, you know, that was the anxiety of the people then. And mm -hmm. looking to something that really isn't going to work, but actually make things worse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can tie that in. And there's lots of other ways. I will quote mm -hmm. Rabbi Paul Steinberg again when asked, what part of the Torah, what text in the oral Torah you know, speak to, you know, addiction. And he says the whole thing. And uh, I found that that's true. I've, I've spoken at synagogues, you know, different Shabbat services, and it's been a different Torah portion. I haven't found one yet that I couldn't weave in with addiction and recovery. I mean, some are a little bit harder than others, but they can all be, um, be incorporated. That's great. That's great. I imagine it takes a certain degree of creativity to weave that into every single tour portion, but yeah. <laughs> as I great. said, some are harder, harder than others. Some just absolutely give it to you and others, uh, it's a stretch. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Marla, for joining us on the show, this episode. Thank you so much, Marla. You're welcome. It's really a pleasure. Absolutely. Um, oh, my pleasure. And before we go, Marla, is there anything that you would like to promote? Yeah, I'd really like to encourage everyone to go to Jewish Addiction Awareness Network's website. There are just, there's tons of information and resources on the site. Uh, the, you can get there by going to jaanetwork.org. And also in particular, when you're on the website at the top banner on the homepage, there's a link to link to our new How to Be a Jewish Recovery Ally Guide. Uh, and it's a downloadable PDF um, and there, if you really want to know how to be an ally, um, or if you are a family or individual affected by addiction, and you want others to know how to be an ally, uh, this is a great guide um, hmm. to use. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, Marla. This is uh, this has been fantastic and enlightening. And uh, with that, I want to say l'chaim. L'chaim. We toast with water. <laughs> there we go. <laughs>